Welcome to this video. My name is Phil and I'm a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Lincoln. And in this video, I want to go back to the transit method for detecting exoplanets and have a look at something that can cause an asymmetric transit. So normally we think about the transit as the planet passing in front of the star, block some light up. They're typically going to be symmetric, but there is something that can cause it to become asymmetric. And this is down to the fact that the orbit might be elliptical. So if it has some um, eccentricity, then we can actually potentially work out what that is by looking at asymmetry in the transit itself. So just a recap then of the transit method, and this is where a planet will pass in front of the star as we look at it. We can then actually measure the brightness of the star. It will then dip down as the planet passes in front because it blocks some of that light out. From that dip, we can actually get the size of the planet and its orbit and things like that. Now, for a single planet that is on like a circular orbit, we would expect each transit to kind of be the same, but also the time between each transit to also be the same. So we wouldn't expect transit one and two to have a different time between them in comparison to transit two and three. We would expect the time between each one to be the same. We would also expect that transit one, transit two, transit three would take the same duration. So that it would take the same amount of time for a planet to pass in front of the star. That is fairly typical if it was a circular orbit and there's only one planet there, there's no other interesting things happening with the actual system itself. Um, so for a circular orbit, we do expect it to be constant. And the reason for that is that the circular orbit, the orbital velocity is going to be constant. So the, the speed of that planet as it orbits around the star for a circular orbit doesn't change. It's always going to be orbiting at the same speed. So it doesn't matter what part of its orbit we actually observe it at, the transit duration, the time it takes to pass in front of the star, should always be the same because it isn't actually changing its velocity. The speed it passes in front of the star doesn't change because uh, that's one of the key things of a circular orbit, basically. Now, it does affect it if the orbit is now elliptical. Now, most planets, are, they're going to have elliptical orbits. We don't really have true circular orbits. It might be close to circular, but most are going to be considered to be elliptical. So the orbital velocity on an elliptical orbit does change. Now, the fastest part will be at the pericenter when it's closest to the star. So actually, as it comes in closer, it will orbit faster, so its velocity increases. And then the slowest part will be at the other part when it's furthest away. So when it's furthest from the star, it will then travel it at its slowest. Now that has an effect on the transit duration, how long it takes to pass in front of the star. So the furthest away, when it's going kind over of at the apocenter, it will take the longest. You'd expect the transit to be longer because it's traveling at its slowest on its orbit at that point. So in that configuration, when it's positioned like this with respect to Earth, we would expect a longer transit duration. Now, at the other part of its orbit, the pericenter, we would expect the opposite. We would actually expect it to be shorter. So the shortest duration for a transit will occur at this orientation here. And actually, in between those two positions, we would expect a varying amount of transit duration from maximum to minimum. And it would depend on the actual orientation itself. So the transit will actually be symmetric at only two locations, at the apocenter and pericenter, and that's because the velocity here is going to be symmetric as it passes the actual star. So you're not going to get a velocity difference across the star as it actually passes at these two locations here. Because actually at those two locations there, the velocity is going to be switching from going slower to going faster, so it kind of hits like a almost like a static point there where it stops increasing in velocity and then will reverse and go the opposite way. And the same is true for the other part. So it, the transit will only be symmetric for an elliptical orbit at these two locations here. So because of that, the planet or the, yeah, the actual ingress and egress should be the exact same. So the part where the planet begins to transit the star which is the green part, the ingress, and then the egress, which is the part where it begins to leave, exit transiting the star. Because it's a constant velocity, the time it takes to do both of those should be the same. That's what gives us our symmetric transit. Now, if it's elliptical, 
it begins to change. And if we are on a part of the orbit that is not at the upper center, pericenter, then your ingress and egress times are not going to be the same. So if you have a look at this here, if we were to view it in this configuration here, we would expect that the first part, the ingress, is going to have a different time to the egress, because actually the velocity across that is changing. So we're going to expect an asymmetric transit in this particular situation. So as it's passing in front of the star there, the first half is going to be traveling at a different velocity on average to the second half where it will begin to exit the star. And that's because across the star, its velocity is not constant and it is changing. Although I have actually put here that it's constant. In this case with an elliptical orbit, that is not the case. So we would expect something a little bit like this then really. The ingress and egress are going to have different timings because of that. And this is massively exaggerated and not completely true. But this is just to give you an idea that the timing between each part is going to be different. Because you've then got the asymmetry or there's no constant velocity across the star as we view it. So we do expect some asymmetry. And it could be the other way around. It all depends on the actual orientation of the orbit itself. And this can actually be useful if you want to constrain the eccentricity, how elliptical that orbit is, and also the orientation of that orbit for an exoplanet orbit, because they can be quite hard to determine, basically. We can get the orbital period, we can get the inclination. To get the eccentricity, we probably need to look at something like this. The asymmetry in that transit can then give us a bit more information as to what's actually occurring there. So it's interesting how much information you can actually get just from that dip in brightness of the star of the exoplanet you can get the orbit you can get the size of the planet you can get you know the orientation of that inclination you get loads of information just from the light that it blocks out from that star so thank you for watching and if you enjoy then do check out some of the videos